Today I want to talk about benefiting from bad decisions. Benefiting from bad decisions. Help me before you have your seat and turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, you can benefit from a bad decision. Benefiting from bad decisions. You may be seated. All of us have moments in our lives where we mess up and make major mistakes. Times in which we blow it and do something completely wrong where we make a mistake or a misstep. Sometimes after we have made a mistake, we ask ourselves the question, can anything good come out of this? Sometimes after we've made a bad choice or decision, it seems as if it is literally irreversible. And I want to give someone relief on today who is wrestling with regret. Perhaps you've made some bad choices or decisions and it's been difficult for you because you have found yourself haunted by the ghost of guilt because of bad choices and decisions that you made. It's important for us to understand that God does not want to put us in a prison where we languish away behind the bad decisions that we've made, but God wants us to find freedom from our failures. And can I tell you that your, fa- your failure should not be your final move? God is a redeeming God, a saving God, and a God who can reverse even what seems irreversible. And after you have made some mistakes, God has still got another move. In fact, the Bible says in this particular passage of Scripture, God had called Israel to conquer the land of Canaan. Joshua is the leader and the general, and he leads Israel in the conquest of Canaan. They do well in Jericho because the walls came tumbling down. They go in and conquer the city. From Jericho, they go to Ai. They have a mistake and a setback, but God allows them to rebound and retake Ai. They move from Ai, and watch this. This is when Joshua makes a major mistake. God had already told the children of Israel, I don't want you to make treaties with them. I don't want you to come into covenant with them. I don't want you to make deals with them. I'm calling you to conquer the land. I don't want you to come into a relationship with them because it is going to cause you to get sideways of me. After the Gibeonites heard what Joshua did to Jericho, they decide to come at it from a different angle. They conclude that we cannot beat them heads up, but so what we need to do is to gather the moldiest bread we can, the oldest clothes that we can. We can share with them a story that will dupe and deceive them into making a deal with us. And the Bible says they weave a web of deceit. They come into an alliance with Joshua, and the Bible says, verse 10 again, but Joshua did not seek the Lord. How is it this man who followed after God, who has succeeded after he'd heard the voice of God, makes such a major mistake and misstep? It's because the reality is all of us at one point of time or another will make some major mistakes and wrong moves. What we must realize is life is an on-the-job training course. All of us will make some wrong turns and bad decisions and bad choices. You'll make them in parenting, in picking a partner and relationships. You'll make a wrong decision in your finances, in your career, and in every area of your life. And here's what you and I must discover and remember. Life is something you learn to do better as you live. And it's really your bad mistakes that often help you make better mistakes, but you are going to make some mistakes. You don't learn how to ride a bike without falling off of it. You don't learn how to walk without stumbling. You don't learn how to drive without a few fender benders. You don't learn how to cook without burning something up. You don't learn how to iron without burning a good pair of pants. You don't learn how to live your life without making some mistakes and realize life is an on-the-job training affair. And since you are going to make some mistakes, you ought to provide a little bit more grace for other people who will err and make mistakes as well because life is an on-the-job learning process. Notice, and here's what I love about the Bible, because the Bible doesn't hide from us the people God chooses and he uses. Follow me. God chooses some people we would oftentimes dismiss because they made bad decisions. I like the fact that God has a funny way 
of using imperfect people for his impeccable plan. God can still use you despite your missteps and your mistakes. Y'all need me to call some witnesses to the stand. Need I remind you that Noah got drunk, but God still used him. Need I remind you David committed adultery, but God still used him. Moses murdered a man, but God still used him to write the Ten Commandments. Abraham lied about his wife, but God still used him. Peter was a cutting and cussing preacher, but God still used him. This ain't for the perfect people, but is there any Anybody up in here who can give God some glory because God uses imperfect people for his impeccable plan. Touch somebody and tell them God can use you despite your past. God can use you despite your mistakes. God can use you. And I'm so glad God is more concerned about your future than he is your past because the truth of the matter is if God was caught up with our past, none of us could be used. But thanks be be the God who looked beyond my faults and still supply somebody in here ought to holler. Somebody ought to make some noise. Somebody in here should have shouted because the only reason you're here today because God works with marred material. He wants to use you despite your mistakes. Here's what we must understand, Pastor. Are you being soft on sin? No, I'm not being soft on sin. Sin means to miss the mark and fall short. Please hear me. Sin is an archery term. An archer shoots an arrow aiming it on the target, but sometimes he misses the target. Sin is an archery term. It means all of us miss the targets, we fall short. Okay, let me help you. The Bible doesn't say y'all have sin. The Bible says all have sinned. That means all of us at some point or another will miss the target. There was a man who prided himself in being a master archer. He had acres of land on his property and he had trees on that land. His friends would come over and when they came over, to their surprise, he was always spot on because on all of his trees there were arrows point dead center on the targets. And they would applaud him and say, man, you're such a master. And he would, he would relish in their applause and, and accolades. But one day one of his friends came over earlier than the rest and noticed that what the man was doing was that he would shoot the arrow, then he would go back and paint the target around the arrow. It looked like he was always spot on. It looked like he never missed the mark. It looked like he was perfect, but the reality is it was just a good paint job. And the reality is that there's some people who like to pose just like that man. We want to come off as if we always hit the target. We're always on point. We're always the smartest person in the room with a ready word. We always give the accurate assessments and predictions over situations. But the reality is some people have just done a good paint job. This is why you can't be fooled by what people present you because there's more than meets the eye. And God is looking for some real people who will be honest with other people and help them understand, I failed before. I've made some mistakes. The truth of the matter is, I failed my first driver's exam. I messed up my first marriage. I jacked up my finances. I'm the one that lost that job, but I'm a testimony that God can recover you. Are there any people that would be real with me today, that you'd be honest with me today. Let your neighbor know I failed, but God is faithful. Have I got a witness up in this house? Give God some glory, because when you miss the mark, God has still been there. And here's what we must understand. We will all make some mistakes, but some of the mistakes we make, watch this, can easily be prevented. Are y'all hearing me? Some of the mistakes we make, okay, notice the text. Okay, reason I had you read the old text, because the Bible says when the Gibeonites came to them to run game. Have you ever had game ran on you? Game, okay, I know, I'm at the 1130. Have you ever ran game on somebody? Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. Come. They come to them, and they say, we got old moldy bread, old clothes, and the Bible says Joshua did not seek after the Lord for counsel and direction. Some of the mistakes we make could be avoided 
if we would go before God and get counsel and advice from him. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And the problem is that Joshua assumed. See, when you make assumptions, it leads to some mistakes that you could avoid. And the Bible says, instead of seeking God, he listened from them. Every day, hear me. You need to get before God and have him download fresh information and direction. Every day you get up in the morning, you need to run your plans by God to get his guidance. Not long ago, my brother-in-law, I had gotten my phone and we were talking about the GPS system. I love the GPS system. I grew up in an era where you had to have a map. You had to pull over to the gas station, ask people for direction. We're in the 21st century now. All you got to do is GPS some systems or some places of destination in. So we were talking about the GPS and he began to tell me, he said, well, the one you have is old. You need to get the upgraded version because the upgraded version will tell you if there's an accident on the road you're taking. It will give you an alternative route. It will help you know if construction is taking place and traffic is jammed up. It will update you and save you time and money and gas. I said, wait a minute, if I upgrade it and download the information, it's going to save me time, money, and gas. He said, yes, and it'll help you avoid some situations you'll get jammed up in. It'll help you avoid getting caught up in construction, and it will give you an alternative route. I said, sound like God to me. God can save us a whole lot of time, gas, and money. God can save us a whole lot of frustration. Prayer can keep you from falling into some pitfalls and traps. Spending time before God can give you some alternative routes. Is there anybody here who knows, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer, but the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I don't have time to waste, resources to mess up. I need God to direct my path and give me the guidance to get me to where I'm trying to go. Joshua failed to seek after God. Please get this. But here was part of the problem. He allowed himself to make an emotional decision based upon their story. I want to tell you this, be careful not to rely on your feelings because your feelings can fool you. Be careful not to get caught up in your feelings. Look at the facts. Sometimes it doesn't call for a heart decision, it calls for a head decision. Okay, notice this. They come to him and Joshua says to himself, surely I can't turn them away because they got a sad story. Please hear me. You cannot make decisions, commitments, deals and be led by your feelings because your feelings will mislead you into making a major mistakes. Your feelings will get you in a fix. That's why you got to filter your feelings. You got to go before God. Here, let me give this to you. You cannot make decisions of impulse, of anger, of euphoria, of nostalgia, of sadness, out of desperation, out of anxiety, just to get revenge, out of lust, out of jealousy, or out of pride. The Bible says man's heart is desperately wicked. That means your heart has some impurities. You've got some biases you aren't aware of. You've got some prejudices that you aren't aware of. You've got some motives that you aren't aware of. So you need to go before God and have him filter your feelings so he can flush out all of the impurities to help you make a, is this making sense to y'all? Make some noise. Is there anybody in here who can look back over your life and you've made some bad decisions? off impulsive moves, off of going in your feelings. You, you got with the wrong person, and when you look back over your life, you're like, I was caught up in my feelings. Because sometimes you cannot just go off your heart. You got to learn how to use your head. And this is why you need people in your life who can tell you what you don't always want to hear, but who will tell you what you need to hear so that they can check you and help you make the right choices. Because sometimes you might be going off your heart, but you need some people who can help you with your head. I was in Haiti about a year ago when I was in Haiti. The water is so impure that they have 
a filtration system for the water. And we watched them take dirty water and change it into drinkable water. In fact, Aquapel boasts that they can make the unthinkable drinkable. They, they have three levels of filtration. It filters out the viruses, the bacteria, and other harmful organisms that will otherwise be so impure that it would contaminate you. See, they've got three levels of filtration. Here's the three levels of filtration. Prayer. Prayer, number one, then the word. After you get the word, godly counsel. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. This is why you need people who got good sense to advise you and counsel you. How are you going to be a life coach and you living out your car? You can't tell me how to live my life. How are you going to give me marriage counseling and you on your fourth one? I don't think you the one that I can rely on. How are you going to help me manage my money and you done jacked up and filed bankruptcy three, four? Y'all not talking back to me up in here. I need some people who got a proven track record of having made some good decisions to help me. Let me give this to y'all. Recently, I had to make one of, the, one of the toughest decisions I had to make. One of the toughest decisions. And one thing I've learned is to surround myself with godly counsel. And, and the decision, my heart was all up in the decision. My heart was all up in it. And they brought some evidence to me and said, here's what we see. Multiple people who I trust and rely on, who I know don't have, don't have any biases toward the situation. And they came to me and said, this is what we have. I said, I don't believe that. They said, you're in denial. There it is. My heart was so deep into it that I had to separate my heart from my head and separate my feelings from fact. Watch this. Once I made the decision that needed to be made with my head, my heart caught up with my head, and I feel better about the choice and decision. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody here today. Somebody in here ought to shout because you had to make some decisions. You ought to shout because even though you didn't want to let that joker go, good thing you let him go because you'd have had to live the rest of your life with somebody you see wasn't the best fit for you. Sometime when we don't have good sense, God steps in and makes the decision for, oh, God, have I got a witness up in here who can and give God some glory because he's led you this far. Let me tell you something. Don't get so caught up in your feelings. Can I preach in here? Don't you get so caught up in your feelings. Oh, can I preach in here really? Because some people will get close to you and manipulate your feelings. Oh, I know they ain't going to do it. Let me try it. Let me see. Oh, I know I got a special place with them. No, I wish I had a witness in here. I can love you hard and still let you go. I can be faithful and loyal to you, but if you cross me wrong, I promise you, I ain't got no problem. I wish I had some help up in this house. Is there anybody up in this house? Matter of fact, I'm going to treat you so good. That when I leave you or we cut ties, I don't have no guilt in my heart because I've been good to you. Y'all not helping me preach. Watch what he says. You're going to make big mistakes, but you got to move beyond your mistakes. Listen to me. You cannot resign or reside in regretville. You cannot allow yourself, based upon bad decisions you've made, to stay stuck in a situation you cannot change, alter, or fix. What you need to learn how to do is say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to try to make the best out of this situation. And I'm not saying that there aren't times you should not feel bad about stuff that you've done. When you sin, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of sin. So you are not going to feel good after you've done wrong. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 or verse 7 chapter 10, it said godly sorrow leads to repentance. You need to know the 
difference between the Spirit's conviction and Satan's condemnation. There's a difference because God wants you to feel bad after you sin so you could repent. The devil wants you to feel bad to try to separate you from God so you feel like there's no coming back from that. Peter and Judas failed Jesus. Judas hung himself, but Peter was redeemed. You got to know the difference between spiritual conviction and Satan's condemnation because the Bible says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if God has forgiven you, you better learn how to forgive yourself and say, God already knew before I made the mistake, I'd make it, but he still chose. I'm sorry. Can we just shout for a minute up in here? Because God knew you better than you knew yourself, but he still chose you. And here's what you got to understand. Don't allow the disappointment over your bad decisions. Hear me. Somebody got to hear this online. Don't allow disappointment over your bad decisions cause you to go into a depression. You got to learn how to come out of that situation. You cannot let your failed move be your final move. You cannot stay down in a state of depression. You got to bounce back, recoup and recover and keep reaching forward, forgetting those things which are behind me. I'm pressing forward to what lies ahead. And the good news, every morning I get up, I get brand new mercies. The good news is every day God gives me is another day of thanksgiving. The good news is every day God blesses me to see another sunshine. That's another the reset button. So if God has forgiven me, life goes on. Touch your neighbor and help him in here and tell him neighbor, life goes on. I know you had a setback but your setback might be a setup. I know you had a layoff but your layoff might be a lift off. I know you've had some bad decisions but God has a way of causing all things to work together. I'm sorry, I thought y'all came to have church. Is there anybody here who could give God some glory because he can take the bitter and the sweet, work it all together, and still bless you despite your bad choices.
neighbor, God has got you covered. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm chapter 23 is one of the most well-known, memorized, and recited verses in all of Scripture. It is, in fact, the verse that has been recited from nursery rooms to battlefields. It is a psalm that is written by David to share with us the care and the concern that God has for us, each and every one of us individually. David himself, who was a shepherd in Palestine, had a chance to be able to up close and personally recognize the relationship between the shepherd and his sheep. And he gives us a unique perspective on our relationship with God, that God is our caretaker, our provider, and he is our shepherd. There's several things in this passage of scripture that prove that point. Verse 1, he opens and says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, what David is saying is, because God is my caretaker, I don't have to concern myself as to where I'm going to sleep, whether or not I'm going to have enough food, what resources I will have on hand, because the Lord is my shepherd. And because he is my shepherd, he's the one who has the responsibility of caring for me and meeting my necessities. This is not just something that David can claim for himself, but it's something that all of us ourselves can claim. Because the Bible says, just like a father loves his children, so God loves and cares for us. That we are the sheep of his pasture. We are the people who are literally under his protective provision and his care. And for those of us who are in here right now who have children of our own, we realize the unique relationship between the parent or the caretaker and that of the children who are under their care. All of us who have children can testify that our children don't have to work or worry or concern themselves as to whether or not there'll be food in the refrigerator, whether or not they'll have shoes, clothes, heat, or air in the summer. That's our responsibility because they are under our care. Jesus said, if we being evil take the care and the painstaking effort to sacrifice so that we can sustain our children, we can trust and rest assured that God will take care of all of our needs. It's important because watch what David does. He says that the shepherd is responsible for getting us what we need when we need to have it. The Lord, a capital L-O-R-D. That is the unchangeable, immutable nature of God. In other words, when my situations change, I don't have to be worried or concerned because the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is immutable. He is unchangeable. So even if the seasons should change, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows where to get me to so that I can graze. That means that if the spot I'm grazing in now would cut me loose or shut down, God, who is my provider, knows how to get me to better pasture. That means if the still waters I'm drawing my resources out of now should suddenly shut down, the Lord who is my provider knows how to get me to another place. Let me bring it closer to where you are. If the company lets you go, if the place you are leasing your business in doesn't want to renew the lease, if your customers cut out on you, you don't have to be concerned because the Lord is your shepherd. They ain't the only ones who got the green I need. They're not the only ones who printing checks. They're not the only place I can draw the resources from. They're not the only customers who are interested in what I'm selling. The Lord is my shepherd. Not Lily's, not Walmart's, not the salon, not my customers. Jehovah Jireh is my provider. And the God I serve will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He says the Lord is. In other words, God can keep me. And since God can keep me, watch this, the shepherd knows all the sweet spots. In other words, if where I'm at shuts down suddenly and I have to pack up and move, I'm not going to trip or break down because I trust the shepherd's leading. 
That means in some seasons, he'll have me in some place pasturing so I get the resources there. But the shepherd doesn't just know where the grass is in the valley. He can also get me to the mountaintop. The shepherd, that means winter, spring, summer, or fall. All I got to do is call. So if the weather change and the seasons change, as long as I'm lockstep following behind the shepherd, he'll find the sweet spots to sustain me. And David wants us to understand this because God ultimately is the one who's responsible for giving us our resources and what we must understand is as long as we delight ourselves in the Lord he'll give us the desires of our heart as long as we stay close to God we'll understand that not only will God meet our needs but God is all we need see some of us think that what we need is outside of God but when you find God can not only sustain you but God can satisfy you that means if you never do another thing for me I've got joy unspeakable and full of glory that means if I don't get the promotion or the raise that's all right because I got peace which surpasses all understanding I'm satisfied just to be saved I know this ain't for everybody in here but is there anybody in here who knows Jesus satisfies if I don't get the shiny car or the object or the money I got enough in Jesus he can touch me in spots can't nobody else touch me he can put a smile on my face I can't get from nothing else can't nobody do you like Jesus I'm sorry this ain't even in my notes but just for station identification is there anybody here who can testify he satisfies oh taste and see that the Lord is good and he satisfies the longing and thirsty soul watch this he not only will sustain me with resources he restores my soul. The shepherd would get the sheep up at about 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. They had a treacherous track, tough terrain they had to deal with. Sheep would be traveling from about 5 to about 11 o'clock when the sun was at its brightest and hottest. So the shepherd understood, in order for me to really take care of the sheep, I not only have to give them resources, I have to give them rest. That means I got to find a shady spot for me to sit in, make them lie down beside still waters. Watch this. I'm not going to put them by muddy waters. I'm not going to put them where there's brown grass. I'm going to give them the best there is to offer. Once you discover God wants more for you than what you want for yourself, you won't trip on what God you causes you to miss. Because really, you got not going to miss anything because what God has got for you, it is for you. So if that door shuts, that means he got another place. That means if you get turned down, he got another resource. That means if they don't accept your application, he got a better deal. He knows how to get you to the sweet spots to sustain you. The Bible says he not only gives them resources, he gives them rest. Because the sheep would wear themselves out on the track and the tough terrain they had to deal with. So the shepherd understood in order for them to be healthy, their wool to look good, for them to be able to operate and have fatty meat on them, I got to put them in pastures where they can rest, chew the cud, and drink from still waters. Because they are overworked and overwhelmed, I have to give them time to pause and to break so that they can be refreshed, renewed, revived, and restored. And since they don't have sense enough to stop themselves, sometime I got to stop them and make them rest besides still what? Let me help us. Some of us are overwhelmed and overworked. We're going after stuff God don't even want us going after. If you get in the will of God, you won't have to chase money. Money will chase you. If you get in the will of God, you won't have to chase down resources. Resources will chase you. That's why you ain't got to bootleg, kiss nobody behind, do a jig for nobody, because God will get you in the circle. You need to be connected with what you need to connect with, and sometimes God just wants you to rest. Let me help you. Some of us working two and three jobs. Two and three jobs is for two and three people, I heard. Here it is. We're overworked, overwhelmed, drained, mad, 
irritable, not friendly with our families, upset because we going after stuff God didn't want us to go after. Can I let you in on something? Sometime God will stop you, make you sit down before you break down. Sometime God will let you get sick. So you learn to lay on your back and look up to him. I wish I had a witness in here. You better learn how to rest your mind, chew your food slowly, enjoy the company of your friends, have a smile and a good laugh, drive slow on your way to work, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and won't God get you to where you're supposed to go? Because here's what we must understand. He's not just concerned about what they get externally. He's concerned about what they get internally. God knows we tend to get worn out, drained, tired, weary, overworked, overwhelmed. The Bible says he provides rest for his people. And God wants us sometime to sit down and rest. Watch this. The sheep don't like rushing water. There's several brooks in Israel where the water rushes out. The sheep don't like to have to drink that water. In fact, they won't drink it when it's rushing. They'd rather rest, sit by the still waters where they're able to be refreshed, relaxed, renewed, revived, reinvigorated, and restored. God wants us to learn how to relax and allow him to recharge us. Your phone will go dead if you don't learn how to plug it up, sit it down, and let it recharge. If you'll do that for your phone, why don't you do that for your soul? And sometimes say, wait a minute, they don't deserve a response. I'm not getting on social media today. I'm not even going to turn on the TV. I'm going to just sit and meditate on the goodness of God. I'm going to celebrate on how God has brought me. I'm going to celebrate on how he's kept me on my job. I'm going to thank him because I ain't got no bad news from the kids' school. I'm going to thank him that the car I got still fires up. I'm going to thank him that the check came in on time. I'm going to thank him that there's food in the refrigerator. I'm just going to take a moment out. See, some of y'all can't celebrate till God does something. Don't you know he's already done enough? Why don't you just pause right where you are and give him praise? God said, I need you to sit down and relax. Watch this. David was a shepherd himself. David is looking at his own sheep while he's sitting in the shade. David has a moment of meditation with God and says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down beside still water. David has a moment with the Lord. Oh, God. I wish I had a witness in here. Have you ever had a moment with the Lord? where everything around you was quiet and you were still just to know he's God. God wants you to sit down and the Bible says in quietness and stillness you'll find your strength. The reason you are weak, weary, and wounded because you need to sit down somewhere and just let God restore your soul. How many of y'all know after crazy work week dealing with crazy co-workers and those who are over you, sales and demands, you need to come to worship one time out of the week just so that you can be still and say this is God's time I ain't tripping on the greens I'm not tripping on who I need to call I'm going to step back give God a moment I'm sorry is there anybody in here that came to worship him with me oh magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name together David said wait a minute I got to sit down and discover God wants me to rest, be rejuvenated. Hold on. God not only gives me provisions. We see provision, but we also see protection. Let the church say protection. Here it is. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Even when it gets dark, I'm not going to get discouraged because the Lord is still directing me. I'm not going to trip because I trust his leading. Lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. In Israel, the shepherd had to deal with valleys in some places that were 15 to 20 feet narrow. 
it was not only 15 to 20 feet narrow in some places. Some areas, even in the valley, had 1,500-foot drop-offs. So the sheep not only needed the shepherd to guide them, the sheep needed the shepherd to guard them. Because also in the valley, there were strange shadows that would spook the sheep. Some of them real and some of them not real. There were predators, wolves, lions, bears, jackals, robbers that if the shepherd wasn't there would consume the sheep. So the shepherd was there to protect the sheep. When the Bible describes us as sheep among wolves, it describes us as sheep just to help us to know how vulnerable we are to the very real threats there are that we can't see. Let me get ahead of myself because I know you thank God for what he didn't do that you could see, but you got some reason to thank God because there's some stuff you didn't see. There was some stuff lurking behind the shadows. There was some very real threats that wanted to have their way with you. But the shepherd was there to protect. Well, pastor, how does the shepherd protect me? Thy rod and thy staff, it comforts me. Okay, the shepherd had what they call a rod because the sheep, the, sheep, the sheep had no natural defenses. Uh, sheep don't have sharp teeth or claws. Sheep are slow. They can halfway hear, and in some cases, they can barely see. Lions have claws. Tigers have jaws. Bears can crush you. Snakes can strike at you. But sheep have no natural defenses. They need a shepherd, and the shepherd has a rod. The rod is a stick that at the end of it, it has a knob. In that knob, the shepherd weighs that stick down. He puts nails and metal in it so that when wolves and lions or bears would come to snatch away a sheep, the shepherd could throw that stick or he could wield it like a sword. So since the sheep don't have defense, they need a shepherd who has a rod to stop what might come at them. Because there's always some predators who are looking to prey on the sheep. Now, you know what the Bible calls us sheep. That ain't a compliment to us. That's to help us understand that every day we get up, there's some very real dark forces that are waiting on you before your heat hit the floor. There's some very real trouble that's waiting on you. And the reality is the reason some stuff didn't get to you is because God blocked it. The reason some stuff didn't take you out is because God prevented it. The only reason some stuff didn't pull you down is because God let his rod be seen. In fact, God had angels encamped about you. There's some very real bacteria that could have shut you down and killed you. A demented gunman could have put you in his sight. The car driver in the other lane could have veered into yours and had a head-on collision. That sickness and disease that took somebody else, it was really getting ready to get close to you, but somehow God blocked it. In fact, car Carbon monoxide could have crept in your bed while you slept and put you in your, I wish I had somebody in here who could say like the old folks, all day and all night, he's been keeping me from danger seen and unseen. Is there anybody in here that knows there's some stuff that should have took you out, but God blocked. He blocked it. 